All right, well, thank you. So again, this is our abstract writing workshop. Um, this is particularly aimed at trying to help support people to um, uh, prepare for submitting their work to present at the Congress for Conservation Biology for North America. Uh, don't know why that's not working. So I just wanna let you know where I'm speaking to you from. I am near uh, Chimacum, Washington in the United States. Uh, those are the traditional lands of the Skalalum and Chimacum and Skakomish and uh, associated tribes and bands uh, of the Salish Seas. And um, these uh, people have been managing these resources and caring for these lands, waters and peoples for millennia and still are doing an amazing job at that today. Uh, so I just wanted to briefly talk about our intentions and uh, the agenda. Uh, we, as I said before, we really want to encourage people to share their work at NACCB 2024. Um, so we're going to give you an overview of what makes a strong abstract and um, explain a little bit of how they're reviewed explore a couple examples um, of abstracts and titles and how they could be made stronger. But really the core of what we wanna to do today is work in small groups and develop and improve your abstracts uh, and support you to feel really um, confident, excited about uh, what's coming up next when you present your work and, and join the Congress. So uh, I just wanted to first talk about the options that you have for presentations. Uh, there are three, a speed talk, poster or 15 minute oral presentation. Everyone is limited to one presentation where they are the lead author or presenter. Um, and I wanna make a pitch for speed talks. Speed talks are really pithy five minute talks. Uh, they really get you to focus and hone in on the essentials. And that is a lot more effective for broader outreach than the 15 minute oral presentation, which is fine in academic circles and not so fine outside of that. Um, the speed talks will have a group clustered together uh, in related themes, and then there'll be 15 minutes for Q&A afterwards. People often follow up and talk with you pretty excitedly after your speed talk. Um, similarly, the posters are a great option, especially if you have a lot of information you want to convey. You've got a dedicated session for Q&A at your poster, and it really allows in-depth discussion. And so that could be a really wonderful way to do things. And then the 15 minute presentation is a 12 minute talk, three minutes Q and A. And that's a really good choice of what you have is more complex or detailed that you want to kind of provide that that's um, more, uh, more breadth, more depth, uh, that could be a good option. And then just as a tip, it's really great if you can always provide some contact information and a QR code that sends people to a PDF of the slides or your poster. That's a way to also help people connect with you after the Congress. Um, and I've often used that myself when I've seen something really exciting, but I didn't have enough time to really get into it. I follow up with you. So before we get into it, um, we have two common questions that often uh, arise, um, especially for student um, presenters. And so the first is, how do you know if your work is ready to present? And generally speaking, you know, if you're currently preparing it to share out in some way, it's probably pretty close to ready. Um, if you've just submitted it, certainly it's ready. Um, if it's recently been published or it's been some recent activity that you have already have outcomes that you could share, it's ready. So uh, don't feel like it has to be um, something that's been out for a long time or you know, it, it's, it's okay. It's really nice in these conferences to have emerging uh, work. And then um, some folks ask, well, I have some of my results, but I don't have everything done. Uh, that's a very common uh, circumstance. Uh, you do need to have some results to share, some outcomes to share. Um, if you aren't ready to be able to speak about that in an abstract, it probably is too early to try to give a talk on this um, or create a poster on the work. Uh, so, but if you're not certain, uh, you can still provide your best understanding of what your work says what it, what it um, signifies. And if that changes, it's okay to just acknowledge that in your talk. When I wrote my abstract, I thought this, but I did these additional analyses and now I realize that's perfectly fine. It happens to people all the time. So uh, don't let that hold you back either. 
So I first just want to um, draw your attention to the specific requirements for NACCB 2024 abstracts. Um, the first of these is that um, your title is limited to 150 characters. It cannot go on and on. And it must be in sentence case. That means the first word of the sentence is capitalized and any proper nouns. And I'll just show you some examples. Your abstract should be pretty short, uh, a, a, a robust paragraph, 250 words. And you should always begin with a statement that's what your topic and objectives are. So that may be a general topic sentence and then one or two other sentences that connect to your specific work. Your methods in an abstract should be brief, um, unless what your work is, is a methodological piece. Otherwise, your methods should be brief and your results really should only describe major results. Don't describe everything. You won't have space and you'll also lose people's attention. So just your major results. And then be sure you have an ending that has a substantive conclusion um, that will draw people in, make them think, wow, I really want to hear more. So I want to just go through each of those pieces in a little bit more depth on creating that strong abstract. So the first thing is actually the title. Um, it should be a short, informative title. Um, so it's in conveying the core focus and the implications. It should have minimal jargon. Um, and really, this is a lot of people select the talks that they'll attend based on the title alone <laughs> that draws people in. So it really is a very important piece. Um, you should then begin with a single sentence that's conveying the importance of your topic, that's setting the conservation context. So right away, I know, oh, yeah, this is a context I care about. I want to connect to that. I'll get the sense, you know, of, of what you are adding here, what, you know, you're going to be connecting to this valuable area. Um, and then I would really recommend avoid a statement that this is important because people haven't done it that's not too compelling to me. What's really important, what, you know, what is it about that's important? You tell me what's really important about this area, that will draw me in. Right after that, you have your, your additional context and aim that's specific to your project. The location, the ecological, cultural context, um, the focus and purpose of your work is, comes right, right there, first or second sentence. Um, and then again, uh, you may have this, uh, approaches that you have been using that are really a, a key part of what you're going to talk about. And just as a reminder, all of this is important. All of these are abstracts are great distillations of the core, the most important part of your work. So to continue, um, the next piece would be that you'd explain your methods and major results in just a few sentences. And again, methods very brief, unless that's the focus of your presentation. Only highlight the most important results. That's uh, one of the most common mistakes is to, to talk in too much detail about too many different things. And then again, your conclusion really matters. Um, how does this work support conservation? How does this tie in? How does this tie back to that first sentence that you led us into? So you summarize the implications of your work, you connect it to that context, you maybe clarify what your work might offer to others so that you can collectively move forward in this area. Finally, write very clearly and strategically. Um, using an active voice saves words. Uh, it helps bring the person and connect to you better, mostly fairly short sentences, um, and then just go through fairly mercilessly and simplify what you have to say for more clarity. Imagine you're talking to well-educated, but not necessarily expert people in your area so that you're really connecting mm -hmm. to them. And be very selective in what you convey. Every single word counts. So avoid filler statements, filler uh, phrases, and, and jargon. So I wanna turn this over to Anna. Um, because she has another way of, of phrasing this that I, I quite love. Thanks, Martha. Um, yeah, I just wanted to throw a couple of extra slides in here to go over one of the many ways that 
you can structure an abstract. Um, I find this method to be really intuitive um, and easy to remember um, and easy to follow as a guideline. So it's called the and, but, therefore structure. Um, so this is referring to this sort of sequence of statements that you'd be that you might use to structure your abstract. So first of all, you would want to provide context. That's the and part. So you might say statement A and statement B. You're putting two ideas together. You're giving the context. So for example, um, for my own research, I would say maybe sharks live in tropical waters and they are crucial to their ecosystems. And then you present the problem or the question that you have. So that's your your the but part of it. So you'd say, but tropical oceans are getting warmer due to climate change. And then you present your possible solution or your answer to the question, which could be something like, in my case, therefore, we are developing a tool to predict shark habitats under climate change. So you've got this clear structure where you're first giving the context, and then you're presenting the problem, and then you're uh, telling your proposed solution or your proposed answer. And that's usually ends up being maybe like the first half of the abstract. And then from there, you're going a little bit more into your results and conclusions uh, from there. So, sorry, I'm oh, I need to... uh, Yeah, can you advance <laughs> the slide? Yeah, <laughs> I forgot it's not my PowerPoint. <laughs> um, I'll just give you a second to read through this and then you'll see uh, kind of how that structure comes into play. So just give this a quick read and see if you can identify those three sections, the and, the but, and the therefore. Okay. Hopefully that was enough time. Martha, if you could, yeah. Um, <laughs> So you hopefully would have recognized that this first section is the and part, um, where it's setting up the context. We have the genetic evidence is showing that um, historical forest fragmentation shaped the fauna that lives in Central Africa. And researchers uh, have speculated that this population of mandrels diverged into two groups because of this contraction. And then you have the but section which is saying it's, it has a vague clue of the word however in the beginning, or sometimes you'll see yet. Those are good ways to, to tip you off. So however, the effects of climate change on mantle population size is unknown. And then you have, therefore, we use the microsatellite data to explore demographic history of the species. Um, so that's just one example, just one way to structure it. It's one that I really like. Um, so maybe that will be something you find useful as you go through with your abstracts. We can give it back to Martha now. <laughs> Thank you. I love that. Uh, I just wanted to talk very briefly through what it is to do when you write an extended abstract um, for consideration for a student award. Um, so what you're asked for there is essentially it's an opportunity to give additional length and detail. So now you've got double or more of the length, 500 to 800 words, and exactly one key figure or table. So the number of figures or table is not less than one and it's not more than one, it's just one and, and either or. And I really recommend figures. This should be presenting the most important results or the conceptual framework, something that really is big and compelling. And in a way, I take this as a really wonderful opportunity to, to think about, yeah, how could I make that a very compelling graphic? Um, you need to include a 50 word caption and that should effectively and efficiently uh, capture the key points about your um, about that figure or table, and then provide more detail on the specific context of your work. This is a often a really helpful um, to have that longer abstract to do that. Um, maybe more detail on methods, but usually especially your results and especially the interpretation and implications of your work. Why it matters. Uh, that will really make your extended abstract stand out, and it will be then uh, more likely that you'd be selected to be one of those um, that is uh, reviewed during the meeting for a possible award. Okay, so that gets me sort of to the, uh, what are the criteria for selection? Um, first off, I just wanna say in general, um, the scientific committee is trying their best to include as many people as possible. 
And so there are these four areas, um, scientific merit, application to conservation science and practice, clarity, and relevance to the theme that are assessed. Um, scientific re merit really means, it, is this adding something to the field? Uh, it's very, very broad. It could be really, uh, there are many, many, many fields in many, many, many ways we do conservation work. All of them are welcome here. So uh, if your work is not necessarily called science, that doesn't mean it's not welcome. Um, what's most important is that it applies to conservation practice. Can what you do help us do more in conservation? And it's also really important that your abstract be clear because that's a, maybe a bit of a predictor of the talk also or the poster being clear. Um, as far as relevance to conference theme, it's a very broad theme. Um, so you could have something that's really specific uh, and that seems to just, you know, is about celebrating diversity and conservation from summit to sea, or it's something about summits, something about sea, something about diversity. It could be many, many things. So don't let yourself say, oh, I'm not going to present because I'm not sure if it's a theme. Please submit anyway. Just make sure it applies to conservation. Make sure that you write a clear abstract and you're probably going to get accepted. Okay, I just wanna give a few examples um, and then we can start working on your abstracts. So I first want to talk a little bit about titles um, and opening sentences because those, uh, those really draw you in right away. So here's an example of a really good title. Vertebrates in trade pose high invasion risk to the United States. I feel like I really feel well-oriented what this talk is gonna be about. Um, I see an important conservation issue. I know it's about in the United States. So that's that's pretty interesting. And then pair it with its next sentence, which is preventing invasions is the most effective means to limit the ecological, economic, and health impacts of invasive species. I'm like, wow, okay, I'm in. This is a very compelling pairing of a, a very uh, informative title with a really compelling conservation pitch, uh, a, a proposition really. Here's another um, good title. Perverse conservation outcomes of rewards-based interventions. I'm like, I'm intrigued when that, what might be those perverse outcomes? And then the next sentence um, of this abstract was, rewards-based approaches to conservation and environmental sustainability have gained ground over the past two decades. And there I go, oh, it, it's broken. I'm not quite, I'm not continuing to be drawn in by that next sentence, because it really is just telling me this is something that's going on, but I'm not hearing what the importance is. So perhaps an alternative sentence might be something more like Anna's um, approach. Rewards-based approaches to conservation are used to incentivize pro-environmental actions. So that explains a little bit of that title, that, that jargon in the title. However, it's leading me to some something that is going to uh, add maybe something a little unexpected. So, um, Think about how you can compare these because they're really, uh, titles really have a lot of impact. And I um, have this slide, which is taken from Oryx's uh, article on writing for conservation. We have a link to that if you're interested. And while this is about publishing papers, it really applies to, to talks just as well. The two main things they want people to think about are the general appeal of the title, how, how it draws people in, which I've just been emphasizing. And then they also have searchability. Do you have search terms in here? That will be important. And you can think about your title for a Congress as practice for the title for a publication. So in their example, they have four alternative titles. Um, and the first one is the conservation status of the elephant bird on Madagascar. And they say, well, it doesn't tell you what the conservation status is. It does tell you it will be about that. Um, and they think, well, it's, it's, it's just a little flat. Um, and then there's the research question. Is the elephant bird extant on Madagascar? Wow, I don't know. Maybe I should go and find out. Or um, the answer, the elephant bird is extant on Madagascar. That's kind of cool. Um, and then the last one they have is conservation on islands. Is the elephant bird? And they have the species name extant. And they find that's the one that's more appealing because it draws in a more general audience you know, oh yeah, I, I care a lot about island conservation. I'm doing some more work. I want to learn more about that. Um, and then it combines that with the research. 
question. And they also think it's got more search terms, so it will be more discoverable. So again, think about what your title might be. So I want to then just go through an abstract from the last NACCB um, that I thought was quite strong. Uh, it is right under the limit, 245 words. And I'm going to just go through piece by piece and show you know, why, why I think of this as strong. Begins with a clear issue. Turtles are, are one of the most threatened groups of vertebrates, partially due to overexploitation in legal and illegal trade. Okay, boom, problem statement. And then it specifies it's in the United States that there's work on um, addressing illegal trade. And then the, the key part that's for this talk, it's how the issue is framed in the news media influences public perceptions and support around these kinds of management actions. Then it goes into the methods. And importantly, notice that it says, uh, we performed inductive thematic analysis. It's in the active voice. So a very pithy, succinct set of methods. And then they have most of their abstract devoted to results. They have a bunch of key results, and then they conclude with a tie to how it can be applied around reducing wildlife crime. So that's pretty cool. Um, I think you could strengthen it yet even further. You could remove a few, uh, you know, turtles are considered one. Well, how about just turtles are one of the most threatened groups. Uh, increasingly mobilizing, you could take out one word. And then here they have a result that I wouldn't call a major result. Uh, the number of articles per case did not increase over time with the severity of the case or with the severity of the case. So maybe just take that out so that we spend our time reading and thinking about the key results. Uh, there's an also that could be removed. And at the same time, that's just sort of a, uh, a lot of words to say, but you could say one word, yeah. So you could remove a bunch of words. Now it's 220 words. I just gained 25 to 30 words. And I would like to employ those here. At the end, they say, the efficacy of enforcement regulations depends on perceived necessity and legitimacy. That's a really good assertion. So the framing of new wildlife crimes in news media can provide important insights for addressing wildlife trade. What do they actually do you mean by that? You know, what what's what kinds of insights, what kind of addressing, what what might be possible? Are there any examples of something that it, how this has or could be changing what um, the management actions really are? So try taking an opportunity to add some detail, especially at the end, can be really valuable. Okay, I'm gonna, um, we're gonna provide all these slides. Um, and just, there are a few other resources on writing abstracts that might be um, helpful to consult, but we'd like to stop at this point and um, take any questions. And then we can um, take some time doing uh, some work on your abstracts together.